Let's learn how I made this from scratch. Yo, it's Herman here, and we're gonna learn how to make a sick product video from scratch. Are you looking for a quick filmmaking hack or a secret cheat that will instantly make your video better? If so, Take your mouse, move it all the way to the X button and click it because that's not what we're going over today. Now, what I will be doing is taking a deeper dive into the entire process of producing a product video from start to finish. That means from first laying eyes on whatever you're shooting and knowing absolutely nothing about the product all the way to editing and delivering the final result. Essentially, you'll be shadowing me through an entire project, not the time to feel self-conscious. Now, this is intended to be a guide for you to watch back whenever you're stuck on a project or if you want to get into this type of filmmaking, but you don't know where to start. By watching this, I hope that it'll give you the confidence to make a badass commercial while equipped with the knowledge that I share with you today. And I believe that what you'll learn is not limited to just product videos, but techniques that are applicable to other genres of filmmaking as well. But first, who the f am I? And why should you even listen to me yap for an hour? Now, some of you may already know me as an instructor on the Olufemi channel, but I'm a videographer slash video editor that specializes in short form content. I've been fortunate enough to have shot and edited for a variety of mediums from commercials to live concert visuals and made content for companies like Netflix and Reebok. Just as a preface, I'm not saying that what I'll be teaching you is the right way or the industry standard way of making product videos because no one taught me this. When I went to film school, they didn't teach you how to come up with good ideas for commercials or music videos or social media content. They focus more on the structure of creating a narrative film. A lot of that knowledge can be translated to what I do today, but 80% uh, of what I do is pretty much self-taught through YouTube tutorials like this one. But if people have been constantly giving me their money to make them videos for the past eight years, I might be onto something. So I wanna save you the time that I've wasted through trial and error and make the mistakes for you so you can benefit from the lessons that I've learned along the way. Now, who is this guide for? I think it's great for those who want to get started in this niche of filmmaking, especially with the rise of e-commerce and the growing demand for eye-catching advertisements. This is also for people who are experienced but wanna see how it's being done from someone else's perspective. Maybe there are some tips they can take away but never thought of, or they just want someone to criticize in the comment section below. I don't know, I can't stop you. With the rise of other amazing YouTubers in the field like Daniel Schiffer and Austin Paul, I think their tutorials are amazing and they have fun to watch behind the scenes, but this video is designed to be more comprehensive and focus on the entire process from scratch. So hopefully by watching this video, you can know absolutely nothing about making videos and end up still making something effective and engaging. Since it's best to learn from example, the plan is to make a spec ad for a cheap speaker that I was given away for free when I bought a pair of shoes from Puma. I figured that if I can make something as simple as this look epic, then it can convince you that making a cool product video may not be as intimidating as you think. Let's dive into the juicy part and talk about the secret formula to why I believe makes an effective product video. This is a structure that has worked for me over the years and can be easily applied to any commercial with any duration. Now, product commercials for social media is is the easiest example to apply this to because it needs to be short and straight to the point. So we've got three key elements, the hook, supplement, and money shot. The hook is something that instantly hooks the viewer's attention right away so they don't scroll past your video or click away from it. Supplement is the term that I use to describe the shots that supplement the intention of your video. In this case, for a product video, you'd be shooting shots that highlight certain features about the product. The money shot is usually the climax of the video that presents the product in its most attractive way. Usually it's at the very end of the video so that when they finish it, they're enticed to buy the product or click somewhere for more information. That's it. That's all I believe there is to create an engaging product video. I honestly think all it takes is three good shots and you can pull off something effective. To prove this, I'll show you three examples of the formula in action. The first one is a video I made to promote some kicks. It was a collaborative release by a few brands, including Reebok. Let's check it out.
Let's quickly break down what's going on here with the secret formula. The very beginning starts with a line of text to establish the theme, and then we get right into this impactful shot of the brick being slammed down. This was intended to hook the viewer by enticing curiosity with what the one-liner could mean, and then immediately hit them with literally a brick. Now, all the shots that follow after are a supplement because they build on the narrative that only raw objects were being used, like these bricks and the sheet of metal, making the production of the shoes more impossible. Then we get into the money shot which is the initial reveal of the sneakers. Now the cards drop into these white shoes and then transform it into the new design. Now I did say that the money shot is usually last, but this is a bit of a special case because we had this magical moment that I think excites the viewers the most. The end shot could also be considered the money shot since it shows the shoe uh, quite handsomely along with the other brands and the viewers are thinking, Oh sh I gotta cop this now. Love Fantasy, love Deal, love Reebok, and these shoes are looking fresh. So that's a quick little breakdown on how it was structured using the secret formula. Uh, you might be thinking, Herman, that's dope and everything, but just because the videos you work on use the formula, it doesn't mean everyone else uses it. You are absolutely right, and that's why I wanna show you two more examples from a couple creators that I admire. It's gonna be Austin's video starts with such a sick shot of the tilting box, which I consider the hook because it's a visually interesting shot that pulls you in and makes you want to see what's next. The shots that follow after supplement the idea of how tasty these pancakes are and I mean, come on guys, just, just look at them. My mouth is kind of watering right now. Really well executed shots with a nice variety so the video doesn't feel stale. Finally, we have the money shot. Uh, we've got the box, we've got the pancakes, and it's placed really nicely in this cozy environment. Then the logo comes in. It's awesome stuff. Sounds like Austin stuff. Awesome Austin stuff. Filmmaking, I'm gonna be a rapper. Lastly, we have Daniel Schiffer. This guy has been blowing up on YouTube and he deserves it. Remember how earlier I said, I honestly think all it takes is three good shots and you can pull off something effective. Here's the proof. Boom. Done. Delivered everything you need to know about the product in three shots. The first shot hooks the viewers with a slow-mo shot of coffee beans flying at me and just try ignoring coffee beans being thrown at you. It's kind of hard. Next, we have a shot that supplements the idea that it's coffee by having this beautiful shot of cream clouds. Finally, bang. Java Monster is revealed and drops on a bed of coffee beans. Hopefully by breaking down these examples, you can start seeing the way that I see product videos and why I structure it the way that I do. It doesn't even have to be product videos. It could be a video promoting an event. The same structure can help make it more effective than just some shots that are slapped together. With this equipped in your tool belt of knowledge, let's move on to the first phase of making the video pre-production. During pre-production, it's a good start to gather all the ingredients before brainstorming so you have enough prompts to come up with creative ideas. Good ideas don't manifest out of nowhere all the time. So you have to give yourself as much insight about the project or product as much as possible. And here are some ways to do so. Number one, ask the client themselves. Uh, they often already have the general vision of what they want to showcase or keynotes on what aspects of the product they want to feature. Number two, study the product. What is it? What does it do for people? What does it look like? Who would want to use this? And what were your initial impressions of the product that stood out? Number three, study the brand. Uh, what's the theme of the brand? Uh, what style do they gravitate towards? What are their color schemes? things like that. Once you've done those things, what does this exactly accomplish? What does it do for you? A, you'll have a full understanding of what you're trying to accomplish with the commercial. So if there are any last minute decisions or changes, you know how to stay on track with the important components or aspects to feature. B, from this, you can begin to develop a shot list and create a list of props or set deck and start looking for music, arranging assets like motion graphics or overlays or sound effects. It becomes a starting ground to get the gears moving in your head and my gears are always rusty. That's why I try to gather as much information as I can. The goal is to tailor the ideas and apply your tool belt of filmmaking knowledge to convey the purpose of the product slash commercial. Not sure if that made sense. English is my 
My first language? It's my second language. Well, my excuse is pretty garbage anyways. <laughs> Moving on, let's talk about generating ideas from scratch. Now, people will often wonder, how did this creator come up with such an amazing idea? It must be a creative genius. Actually, they might be, but most of us aren't. And we can't come up with amazing things from thin air. And I find comfort in believing that it's intuition that can be built. Here are a couple ways to get the ball rolling and build momentum when brainstorming ideas. Number one is to brain vomit. And what I mean by that is you take all the ideas that are floating around in your head, they're kind of half-baked ideas, but you want to try them out, actually write those ideas down in as much detail as possible because these are simply dots that can be connected later on when things are a little more fleshed out. While you're creating a shot list, for example, you can think back, oh yeah, I want to try this idea out. Number two is to break it down. Now, what I mean is if you're in a situation where your client simply trusts you to make something cool and doesn't really tell you clearly what they're looking for, it means they don't know what they want. It'll give you the freedom to be creative. However, with great freedom comes great anxiety because now there's this pressure of making sure it's amazing without even knowing where to start. If that ever happens, try this. Look at the product and list everything about the product. Usually it takes a little more time, but there's no need to rush yourself and just go out for a walk, make coffee, and really try and break down the components of the product and brand. Let's look at the list that I came up with. So these were some words that came to my mind when I was looking at it uh, for a little longer and off camera. First one was that the speaker is black. And then I wrote in parentheses, midnight slash eclipse because it's round, reminds me of an eclipse, and it makes me think of midnight with how dark it is. I know, it's obviously black and it doesn't really mean much, but it can come into play later when I'm trying to think of ideas of shots that I can incorporate. Number two is speaker and that it produces sound. I'm a genius. But this is what I meant when I talked about breaking down the components of the product. So if it's a speaker, maybe I can think about how can I visually show sound? So maybe not sound itself, but the way that its environment might be affected by the sound. Number three, I wrote cylindrical. So maybe there's a shot of the speaker rolling. Next, I wrote that it has a circular top and bottom. So I thought there could be some potential for a graphic match cut in the edit. Next, I wrote that it was compact. So maybe I could place it in a pocket or a bag. And then I wrote the name of the brand, Puma, which you know is an animal and it's a fierce one. So maybe I can incorporate that kind of vibe. Next, I wrote that it was durable. And I don't know if this thing is actually durable because it looks like a cheap speaker. Since this is a spec app, I can just pretend that it is. And it's important that you do write down the features that you want to actually highlight. Lastly, I wrote Puma brand, which as we know is an athletic clothing brand. So I thought maybe I can incorporate some athletic lifestyle shots or attire to help really build that theme. Honestly, I don't know how many ideas from this list I'm gonna be using. It could be just one idea out of the eight. It could be all of them, I don't know. But at least it's helping me kind of get the gears moving and that's the goal of this phase. Now, the third way to generate ideas is to apply techniques to your breakdown. Now, you may naturally generate ideas just from breaking down the product earlier. For example, having the item cylindrical already lets me imagine that the product could be rolling on a surface with the camera at surface level or having the dirt rumble on the surface to visually show sound. If there are certain aspects you wanna highlight but you don't know how to show it, literally go through a list, whether mentally or physically, of different shots or framing that can be applied to your breakdown. An example would be the product being cylindrical in this case, so it can roll. How would it look like eye level with the product if it was rolling? How would it look like from a bird's eye view? Would it look better as a wide shot or a tighter frame? What's the advantage of one over the other? Keep doing this until something sticks. If your brain is fried and you just blank out all the time like me, just move on and go back to it later. Repeat the step for each aspect that you broke down. Number four is to steal like an artist. It's a book by Austin Kleon that does an amazing job conveying some key points to remember as a creative. Now, what that basically means is to take the best bits of someone else's work and apply it to your own. Do that with multiple different sources and then you get this hybrid of best bits and congratulations, you created an original idea. You have to know that nothing is actually original. It's just a remix of other ideas and being able to hide their sources well. Of course, make sure to credit your sources as well. But how does this apply to creating an effective product video? A, if you are making a product video, watch other product videos that have been effective, are successful, or have inspired you. Write down all the things that you like about it and how you can apply them to your own video. Do this with multiple product videos and now you have the best bits of multiple sources. Another way is to basically not limit yourself to just one medium. So for example, look at product photography and the way that they light their scenes or use set deck to enhance the product. Take these bits
bits as well and add it to your mental tool belt. So before we start shooting, you wanna make sure you've got a few things ready. Number one is the idea approval from the client. So you will want to create a pitch deck, an outline, a treatment, whatever your preferred method is to convey your idea to the client. Because your job is to get whatever that's in your head into your client's head. And the more fleshed out your idea is, the better. So here are some ways that you can do it. One way is to create a pitch deck. And I use Canva to create a presentation with descriptions, mood boards, images, and other video references that are similar to my idea. Not sponsored by Canva, by the way. Incorporate as many visuals as possible instead of words so that your client can actually see in their head what you're going for. Another way is to create a ripomatic, And basically what that means is to make your product video by editing a bunch of shots from other existing product videos. That way it'll give your client the general idea of the mood or the style or shots that you're going for. It's kind of like a Frankenstein of other videos to make your own and piece only the shots that are relevant to your idea. Third way is to create a dummy ad and shoot it yourself. So for the Reebok ad that you watched earlier, it was actually shot in Taiwan, um, but not by me. I was a creative director, but I wasn't the on-set director. With the state of the world, traveling is a no-no. So what I did was shoot everything shot for shot in my basement first as reference on how I imagined the shots should look like and then sent that off for approval. So you can shoot this all on your phone and film all the shots in the general framing and movement that you have in mind, cut it together with your chosen music and have a baseline of what your video will kind of look like. The next crucial thing that you want to do in pre-production is to make sure that you have a shot list. What's that? As the name implies, it's a list of shots that you want to shoot. So all those ideas that you generated earlier during your brainstorm session, make a list of the shots that you want to do and you envisioned in your head. So what I do is list out all the shots I would like to see and can visualize in my head and then order them in a way that's coherent when played uh, one shot after another. Now, if you have a hard time imagining some of these shots visually in your head, what you can do is draw them out onto storyboards, which is a standard practice in film, especially if you need to communicate these visuals to your client. Basically, it's like drawing out a comic strip with information about your shots. The advantage of this is that you can cut out these frames out of your storyboard and you can move them around to reorder them and then visually see in front of you how your video plays out. Now, I won't be covering this since I usually only do these for bigger shoots and if I can't do a ripomatic or a dummy ad. So when creating a shot list, you may want to physically write one out or have one printed out, which is how it's traditionally done, but I don't personally like carrying paper around with me while I'm shooting, especially if I'm a solo shooter and I'm just like running gunning. My preferred method is to just write it out onto Google Keep and then have them as checklist items so that I can check them off as I finish shooting them. Which leads me to going over the shot list that I made and I wanna talk about the logic of how I chose the shots that I wanted to use or at least try my best to explain it. All right, this section is about to get a little bit beefy. All right, so we got a shot list right over here. Right, right over there. And uh, let's go through each shot one by one. And as it indicates on the top in the title over there, it says that it is an edit order. And what I mean by that is that I first like to lay out my shots in a chronological order in terms of editing so that I can, you know, have it play out in my head and know what shot comes after another and it'll all make sense. But uh, later on, I'll also make a copy of the shot list and rearrange them into shooting order so it'll be grouped together in a way where it is more efficient when I am on set. Now we'll be talking about how to prioritize your shots later on in this video and there will be a specific category talking about prioritizing your shots, so don't worry. But for now, I just want to go through what each shot is and why I chose to, I guess, include that in my list. Now this this isn't the neatest shot list, but it works for me. I just like to you know, put in some keywords so that I have the general visual in my head. And uh, the first one on the list is the bird's eye. Uh, it says that it's a bird's eye shot and the speaker sits on the surface. The light will swing to create a uh, light movement along the rim of the speaker. So the reason I want to go with the bird's eye is because it shows the top circular uh, shape of the speaker and it kind of builds this mystery. It's like you don't know what it is yet, uh, but you kind of know what the shape is. So it's, it's these shots that kind of like establish and build up to the the reveal of the product, uh, which happens later on. But uh, this is kind of like that hook. It's kind of like a rumbling kind of circle. So it builds this mystery as to what is this? Why is it rumbling? It's so dark and mysterious. And it kind of adds to this uh, mood, you know, this dramatic tension that makes any sense. I don't know if it does, but it makes sense in my head. And then the shot afterwards is an insert. And when I write insert, you know, the framing is really loose. It's mostly just so I have coverage of the shot. So I don't know exactly how I want to frame it, but I do know that it'll be kind of tight on whatever that, that's happening. And in this case, it is a rumbling surface with uh, rock slash dirt. So I wasn't sure if I was gonna go with, you know, tiny little like pebbles or rocks or like sand or something like that. But whatever that was, I guess, like thick enough so that you can see it kind of like vibrate 
and jump around. And the reason that I chose this shot is to, uh, like I said kind of before, is that is there any way that I can show the effects of sound instead of showing sound waves itself? Because uh, you can do sound waves in VFX, as I mentioned before, but I wanted to see some shots where uh, sound can affect other things and make it feel more powerful. You know, it feels like it's part of physical space instead of having to rely on VFX. So I thought that this was a great way to do so. The next one was a push in shot. So the camera pushes in to the speaker that is center framed and in the front there isn't any light. So you don't see like the design very clearly. And this is kind of going back to what I was saying before. These first few shots are to kind of, you know, build towards the uh, reveal of the product. So you start seeing kind of the shape and you're slowly revealing the product until you actually see it in the next shot, which is the finger spin shot. Uh, this one, I wrote that it's a match cut from the position of the previous shot. So as you can see over here, um, hopefully on the screen right now, it's from one shot to another. It's that silhouette sort of shot uh, over to the product reveal shot where it lands on my hand. And I wanted to, you know, I thought it was a great opportunity to do a match cut so that it makes sense that I was showing kind of the shape of the product. And then boom, finally we see the product and it all kind of like pieces together. So I wrote that the speaker drops off frame. So like it spins on my finger and then it drops out of frame. And then I replaced the keyed clean plate of speaker spinning feels weird when I'm reading it out loud, but in my head, I, I know what I'm trying to say. Basically, um, I have a clean plate shot of the spinning uh, speaker so that I can kind of swap it from the real one that falls off the frame and then just have it spinning on my finger because I can't actually do that with the speaker itself. I mean, you can probably make like a practical prop, but I'm, I'm not a prop designer. I'm not, I'm, that's not really my area of expertise. And then over here in capital letters that says MG text, uh, MG just stands for motion graphics to me. Uh, I don't think it's a normal thing that people abbreviate, but I like doing that. And I wanted to add in this note that there will be motion graphics so that I can frame it so that the speaker in my hand is a little bit heavier on the frame right. And that means I want to leave space for the left side for there to be text. Otherwise, if I don't do that and I just shoot everything in the center, then I'm not going to really have much space for text. So this is something I need to plan ahead of time. And that's why I just wanted to include it in my shot list in case I forget while I'm on set. So uh, the next one is this arrow pointing up to the shot above it saying that I want a clean plate of the speaker spinning on fishing wire. I wrote to shoot it in slow-mo, although I realized that I didn't really need to do that because it ended up playing real speed, but I just wanted to make sure that if I decide that later on, I want a moment where there's like a speed ramp where it like slows down dramatically, then I want to have that option. But in this case, I just went with real time, it makes less work in VFX as well. So my future self was quite happy with that. And I didn't write it here, but I'm shooting it in front of a green screen so that I can key out the green and then slap it on top of my finger spinning. And the next shot is to push in, another push in shot, but this time a full shot of the speaker, uh, pushing tighter to end of speaker as it hits the surface. Okay, I understand what I'm trying to say. Basically, I wanted to kind of get this kind of close up on the point of impact so that the speaker falls. So remember how in the previous shot, it falls out of frame. So the next shot I wanted to show showcase durability. And I thought that a great way to show that is to basically just have it you know, slam against something or like drop down or something like that because that's a common occurrence. That'll happen sometimes. You'll drop things and you want to find out if it'll break or not, like your phone or something like that. So same for the speaker. Uh, one of the features I wanted to showcase was that it was durable. And that's part of the reason why there's a spinning on my finger shot. So it justifies it kind of falling off and then landing on the surface. And then it's like, don't worry, it's got a durable build. And that's when the text will come up, which is why I wrote MG text durable build. So the next shot is the revolving shot. And what I mean by that is that um, I'm gonna whip tilt down to reveal the finger. Uh, so it'll, the camera will kind of follow the tilt, the words are not my friends today. So the finger will come down, it'll press basically the screen on a uh, phone and it'll kind of do this indication where it's connecting to the Bluetooth because I wanted a creative way of showing Bluetooth. And I also thought it would be a creative camera movement, like a bit of an ambitious shot that I really wanted to try where the surface spins around 180. So it'll be like pressing the phone and then the surface will kind of like spin around and then reveal the speaker that it has connected to Bluetooth. And it didn't necessarily have to be a shot like this to showcase Bluetooth pairing. You know, there are so many ways that you could do it, but this is just one of those things where I kind of like attach an idea of camera movement to the idea of showcasing Bluetooth pairing. And then, all right, to, to just put it simply, I just wanted to make it look cool. Next, we also have a bird's eye shot. Now, this time also a light swing, but a static shot of the speaker on the surface. Now, it's the same thing. It's the same setup as the very first shot, that very first bird's eye shot, but this time the lighting is a little bit different. And then uh, something that I plan to do is also a light swing. And what I mean by that is I'm going to basically take this LED light stick. Um, there's one actually behind me that's lighting me like that. 
that one right there. Oh my God, it can't point. And the plan is to take that light and then just kind of move it around the speaker so that th there's like this movement of the shadow across the surface. And that's what I have the visual of in my head at least. And part of the reason that I wanted to showcase the shot, not only to, you know, make it dynamic and have there be movement, but not necessarily just the product moving itself, but also the shadow. Um, I wanted it to kind of showcase that 360 surround sound. And I plan to put in text and I also plan on, on putting in some uh, motion graphics, like a waveform type of thing to go around the circular speaker, like along the edge of it. But basically the shadow is kind of moving along, you know, like a circular fashion, if that makes any sense. And that showcases 360. Let's just move on to the next shot. There's an insert of glass breaking. Now that goes with the idea of, like I said before, uh, how sound can affect the environment and other objects and how they can react to it. And in this case, I thought, you know, sound waves could be so loud that it breaks glass, right? Like you think of this cliche of someone singing like their high note really loud and then like a wine glass breaks, right? You got that visual in your head. So I thought, why not incorporate that somehow? So that's gonna be stock footage so that I don't have to do it myself. I don't wanna clean up glass. I don't have the space for that. Next, I've got an insert of Puma eyes and this will be stock image that I'll animate because I I don't have an animal wrangler. I also don't have a puma. So going down that safe road, I'm just gonna take a uh, stock image of one and then I'm gonna animate the eyes so it looks like that it like opens its eyes or something like that. And this kind of goes with that idea that I was saying before where you studied the brand and I wanted to kind of incorporate that animal because it feels fierce, you know, like the tag that I'm using here is like play louder and adding to that fierce uh, atmosphere and aesthetic, I thought, you know, incorporating the animal would be a nice way to do so. And then I think that it also inspired me to go with this color theme of kind of like a black and yellow, kind of like the color of a puma, a black puma uh, with yellow eyes. So that'll be kind of the lighting that I'll be using and the color scheme that I will be going with. And that's the kind of mood that I wanna go with because it's quite dramatic and still works with that whole like fierce feeling. And then finally, what I think would be a good money shot is a gimbal shot where it will orbit from a bird's eye. I don't know if orbit is really the right word, but basically the idea is that it's gonna go from a bird's eye like this, speakers over here, and then the camera will just go like whoop, and then it'll just be uh, to surface level and frame the speaker slightly heavier on the left. Uh, like I said before, I like to leave these notes so that I can potentially leave some room for text later on so that I can make sure that I have the right framing for that. But the reason that I want to end on this gimbal shot is because I think that it really adds to the dynamic of the video. I really want it to feel like a, you know, hype video with quick pacing and, you know, like continue camera movement, like a lot of camera movement. So it feels like it's very like driving. I'm like running out of adjectives here. I gotta pull up a thesaurus here. But yeah, that's kind of the logic of the shots that I went for. I know I didn't explain it super clearly. Hopefully you get a gist of how I came up with them and using the brain vomit that I did earlier and kind of those notes that that I had and just connecting those dots with some of the shots that I know I can kind of pull off. These shots didn't come out of nowhere, right? They were based off some of the features that I wanted to showcase or some of the notes that I had uh, previously that I showed on screen as well. So hopefully you're excited to try this out yourself as well. Now, the third thing that you want to prepare in pre-production is equipment. Now you're going to want to collect all the equipment that you're going to use for your shoot. Make a checklist for yourself before you leave so that you don't miss anything. That means your lights, your camera, your lens, your gimbal, batteries, etc. Just throw it out all onto a list and take a load off of your mind. Don't be like me and head to the shoot only to realize that you didn't bring your memory cards and you had to drive all the way back home for an hour and have people wait for you as you come back. Rookie mistakes. We all make them. Just don't make this one specifically like me. And here is the list of equipment I'm going to use. Hopefully it's showing up. The fourth thing you wanna prepare is the product that you're actually gonna be shooting. You got nothing to shoot if you don't bring it, but you do wanna make sure that it is in its most optimal condition to actually shoot. So for example, if it's an electronical device, then make sure that it's actually charged before you head to the set. A quick but important tip is to communicate with your client if there is a specific way that they want the product to be shown. So if there's an attractive angle, for example, then this is something that you should know. The next thing is your props and set deck. So these are the additional props that you may need for your shoot or the set decoration to build the atmosphere that you're going for. You may have ideas that involve other objects placed in the frame to enhance the narrative or composition. I don't think it's something that should ever be overlooked, but for this spec ad, I decided to keep things fairly minimal and not introduce many props. I'm going with just the concrete vinyl background and keeping everything else fairly dark so that the center of attention is always going to be on the speaker. I do have some footage lying around though that's behind the scenes of a promo that I did that did involve a little more props and set decks so if that's something you guys wanna see, leave a comment down below and maybe it's something that you can see in the future. But in this case, 
I do think that simple is best. Next is the location. Now, if you have an ideal location to shoot this in, then make sure that you've booked a reasonable amount of time uh, that you've budgeted for your shoot. So maybe you rented out a location and you have to pay for your time there. Maybe you're shooting this outdoors and you have to work around the weather or sunlight. These are things that you'll have to think about now so you don't have another thing to stress out about on the day of the shoot. Thankfully, I'll just be filming downstairs where I'm staying, so I have the luxury of filming anytime. The introvert inside of me loves this. Next thing to prepare is your crew. Now, if you're primarily a solo shooter like myself, or you have one or two people assisting you, then that means you're going to be wearing a lot of different hats. You are basically the director, the cam op, the cinematographer, set deck, prop, wardrobes, editor, VFX artist, colorist, the list goes on. This is a good thing though when you're starting out because you know the responsibilities of many different roles and how they affect the quality of your video. However, if you need an extra hand, make sure it's in your budget to do so. In this case, you're looking at the crew. Next is scheduling. Uh, make a practical timeline for your shoot days. How much time you need will come with experience to determine how long you take to shoot. Every project, however, calls for different lengths, but you should have an idea of how long you take when you're filming things. Things you'll have to take account for is how much time you need to set up your camera, frame the shot, actually shoot it, make props and set deck adjustments. If you need to record fully, for example, basically everything. Again, you're wearing a lot of different hats if you're doing this on your own. So it's okay if you take a little bit longer when you're first starting out. It's a great opportunity to know which areas require improvement or where you may want to hire someone else to take care of in the future. Now, it's important that you don't be unrealistic with your budgeted time as well. If you think that you can set up a shot and shoot it in like 20 minutes, then give yourself half an hour. Keep yourself time efficient, but don't rush yourself to the point where you panic on set and then you do a terrible job. What we do in pre-production prepares you so that it gives you this peace of mind so you have less decisions to make on your feet. I found that one of my weaknesses is making effective decisions on my feet. That's why I always plan as thoroughly as I can to reduce that stress and give myself more time to digest information before making any crucial decisions. So if you want to ask me what I want for dinner, you've got to give me at least like two hours to decide. Okay, so you've got everything set and you know exactly what you're going to be shooting, but in what order? Although you you've budgeted a reasonable amount of time for your shoot, things can happen on set that you didn't really plan for. What if your camera stops working for some reason or your product explodes halfway through? Here are the ways that I like to prioritize my shot list in shooting order. I organize by priority of shots that make your video survive. And what I mean is that I'll always try to shoot the most important shots first to reach the bare minimum quality. If it happens and you don't have time to shoot everything, you'll at least have enough coverage to make something acceptable. That means don't save your money shot last. So on a priority list, here's how I rank it. Number one are the close-ups or the money shots of the product. Now, this is in case something happens to the product midway, like maybe it gets scratched no matter how careful you were with it. If you shoot your close-ups, you don't have to worry about seeing small blemishes on your wider shots. And if you shoot your money shots, then you've got your most pressuring shots out of the way, and then you don't have that hanging over you the entire shoot. I rank number two, locations and sets, because if you have multiple locations or different sets, then it usually makes the most sense to group my shots into that location or set because travel time or set changes take a pretty big chunk of time and it wouldn't be effective to, for example, shoot outdoors and then pack it up and then unpack at your indoor location and then pack up again and go outdoors to shoot. Like, don't be like that. Or let's say you have shots in front of a green screen. You would want to shoot all your green screen shots while that's set up instead of moving back and forth between another set. I rank number three, lighting setups because it takes quite a bit of time to properly light a scene and it's where I find myself spending the most amount of time. Instead of always moving your lights back and forth, try to group the shots with the same or similar lighting setups. Next is camera setups. Now, the reason I rank it number four on this priority list is because it's much faster to switch a lens or move your tripod to another location than it is to move lights around and relight your scene. Even if you're introducing a new piece of equipment, like putting the camera on a slider or a gimbal, I still think it's way more tedious to relight a scene that matches your previous shots. Lastly, we have number five, which are the ambitious shots. You know what I'm talking about. It's the ones that might take 47,000 takes. These are the crazy ideas that you would love to include, but your video can survive without. I always try to include at least one idea that's a little bit selfish and tougher to pull off, but it'll still be okay if it doesn't work out. Okay, maybe I won't be okay, but the video will be. All right, guys, at this point, you are as prepared as you can be, and you've pretty much envisioned how it'll all play out the moment that you set foot on the location. So you'll have the confidence of knowing exactly what you're doing. With that peace of mind, give yourself a little pat on the back. So before we move on to production, I wanna take a quick moment to remind you that everything that you're learning today is completely free, which leads me to talking about today's sponsor, 
me. If you've noticed the edgy futuristic transitions and titles that I've been using throughout this video and you thought, whoa, that would be sick to use in my videos. Well, you're in luck because I made a pack designed for modern creators like you who want an edge in their work. Enter the Future is a motion graphic asset pack that I handcrafted and includes a variety of assets that you can use for your music videos, commercials, live streams, narrative films, you name it. It comes with an unlimited license. So once you buy it, it's yours to use forever for as many end products as you wish. I also include a tutorial that teaches you how to use everything, even if you're a beginner at After Effects. So if you need transitions, borders, or custom text animations to give your video a modern edge, I recommend checking it out by clicking the little pop-up in the corner or going to the link in the description below. It's viewers like you who support me that makes this video possible where I can share my experience to help others. All right, you've just rolled up to your location, my basement in this case, and you've got all your gear laid out, the product is ready to be shot, and most importantly, a coffee in your hand. Where's mine? Oh, I just finished it. What now? Well, let's walk through the five steps together that have worked for me. Step one you wanna first gather everything that you need. The first thing would be your camera equipment and lighting. So you can't shoot your product without the equipment to do so. So whatever that you had on your list, uh, go through it to make sure that it's all laid out in your designated workspace. That's the space that you'll be building your camera and stuff. So just don't leave your camera on one table and then your batteries in like another and then a tripod in a washroom. I don't know. Unpack it all in one space so that you know where everything is when you need it. Second thing is your product. You don't have anything to shoot if you don't have your product. So make sure that you've kept it safe because if it breaks, so will the relationship with your client. The third are the things that maintain the quality of your product. So these are things like air dusters or your microfiber cloth or a lint roller. You know, when you're shooting your close-ups, nothing will disappoint you more than finding little specks of dust on your product once you've wrapped everything up and you're reviewing your footage on a computer monitor instead of this little LCD screen on your camera. So make sure to pay attention to dusts or scratches because it's one of those things that are not fun to fix in post-production. General rule of thumb, just never tell yourself it's okay to fix it in post because it's not. It really isn't. Fourth thing to gather is your props and set deck. So if there are any additional props that you've planned to place in the scene to build the environment and atmosphere for your product, make sure it is ready to go. Number five is your food and crafties. Set a designated area for food and snacks because it's important to feel yourself and the crew on set. If you're a solo shooter at home, then you don't have to really worry about it because you can just walk over to your kitchen and then take a quick break. But make sure that if your shoot is planned to be long, that you do take a little food break to keep your energy up. Now the sixth thing is if you are a solo shooter, bring something that gets you going. You know, maybe it's a speaker and you play some music to keep you in a good vibe, or maybe it's some coffee on the side. It's that day to treat yourself, go to Starbucks or something, I don't know. Uh, it's gonna be a tough day, so make sure that it is as enjoyable as possible. Let's move on to step number two, which is to set up your scene. So if you've got props or things to set up the scene, then bring it out and set up the stage for your product. Now, if you have multiple setups where the product will be in different environments, then set up the first one on your list. I've talked about how you should prioritize your shots in the previous section, so set up the most important scene first. Step number three is to set up your camera. So frame up the first shot of your scene, which is hopefully the most important one on your shot list. You wanna know what the camera sees first before you start messing around with the lights. Now, sometimes I'll set up the lights first if I already know what I'm generally looking for, but I think it's good to first look through the eyes of the lens until you're used to knowing how light affects your shots. Step number four is to set up the lights. Once your camera is set up, you're gonna want to light the subject, which is the product in this case. Now, without getting into cinematography and lighting techniques, since that's an entire beast on its own, you wanna make sure that the way that you light your product is flattering. Now, different products will call for different themes and different lighting techniques, but to be on the safe side, it's best to light your product with soft and even lighting. So something like a softbox will usually do a great job without too much work. However, if you're just using some lights that you have at home, throwing something like a thin cloth or shower curtain in front of the light will help diffuse it and reduce any harsh shadows that fall off from the subject. Step five is the fun part we actually start shooting. As I mentioned before, make sure that you have your shot list categorized to shoot in the most logical and time efficient way. Now, if your shot list is a physical piece of paper in front of you, cross it off as you go and keep an eye on the time. Now, I think that it's both a blessing and a curse to be a solo shooter at home because there's this luxury of spending a bit more time when no one else is with you. You don't have to worry about Jimmy making sure that he catches this train back home after the shoot or you know, paying him overtime. Sorry, Jimmy. I don't actually know anyone named Jimmy, but that's the easiest way to lose track of time and go a little overboard. Even now, I'll often have a tough time deciding whether a take is good enough for me to move on to the next shot. As you shoot more though, you'll build the intuition to know if the shot is good enough and if you're allotting a reasonable amount of time left for the rest of your shots. Time is finite. 
use it wisely. With all that said, let's go into some behind the scenes of the actual shoot, which is happening tomorrow in this case. I'm shooting all the talking right now, so hopefully I don't make a fool of myself. Otherwise, all this is gonna be a bit of a waste. <laughs> Am I in focus? There's no flip out screen for the a7 III, so I'm just kind of hoping here. I did like a quick test shot, but yeah. So here we are to the uh, behind the scenes portion of the shoot. Um, what do you guys want to see? I guess like behind the scenes, right? What should I talk about? Basically, I've already gone through step one, which is to gather everything. So I'll show you what's kind of around over here in my basement. And um, number two is to set up the... Scene? Yes. So I've got the scene set up already. I've got some lights set up, as you can see as well. We're gonna be striking off these house lights so that it'll feel a little more like cinematic. And yeah, I've, I've already set up the camera as well, but just bring it up. You're heavy. This might look pretty intimidating at first, and it looks like a lot of equipment, but I'm only gonna be using this for one shot, and it is, you know it, the money shot. So I'm doing the most important shot first. Get that out of the way, don't have to worry about it. And it's the most complicated setup as well, since I have it on a uh, gimbal, it's the RSC2. If you're feeling intimidated and you feel like, hey, Herman, there's no way that my video is gonna look as good as yours because I'm not using this fancy camera on this fancy gimbal. You even got an external recorder over here, like what's going on? And I can lie to you and tell you that equipment doesn't matter, or I can tell you how it is and that equipment does matter, but only to a certain degree. I'm just using equipment that I'm already familiar with and that I have some experience with and I know what kind of shot that I want to achieve and what kind of equipment is needed to achieve those shots. But when you're first starting out, you don't have to do like crazy ambitious shots or anything like that. You can just use your iPhone and you can make a really effective video based off the secret formula and everything that I went over in pre-production. So don't worry about that. In fact, if you want to challenge me to like shoot a fully fleshed, like polished product video with just my iPhone, leave a comment in the below. I don't know, maybe it's something you guys wanna see. But I'm gonna put this down because it's starting to get a little bit heavy and let's walk through what exactly is going on over here. All right, so what exactly is going on? If I pull away, you can see that this is the set. So as I mentioned before, it's laid on top of this vinyl of this concrete texture. I literally just bought this on Amazon. Thought it'd be interesting and give that kind of raw and gritty look. And then we got two lights over here. They're, um, I forgot what they're called. They're from Yongnu 360, I think that's the model. And this is a ghetto setup because I literally put some garbage bags on top of it. And then I taped these black pieces of paper to act as flags. And that's one way that you can shape light if you're just using whatever household items. I got two of them right over here. So I got this nice little like edge light along the product. And then my key right now is another one of these. I actually have three of these lights. And this one has diffusion on it. So it's not just garbage bags like the other ones. I know I spent a little more time for this one. It's on top of these boxes so that it can be elevated. As I mentioned before, this is the camera setup. So it's the A7S III. I love this camera and it is on top of the RSC2. I've labeled the uh, equipment earlier so you know what the models are and what I'm using. And then over here is just my laptop so I can play some music, you know, keep myself in a good vibe. Got my shot list over here as well. And I literally have it in a shooting order so I can just check it off as I go. And then we got the rest of our stuff over here. Let's not look at that for too long. All right, so this is the set. Wish me luck and let's see how it goes. So hopefully I can pull this off because I'm gonna need to set off the smoke machine and then run around and actually be the camera operator and frame up the shot. That's what I mean by wearing a lot of hats when you're a solo shooter, so. So the smoke adds some atmosphere. We turn the gimbal on. Hopefully the smoke stays. Hit record on the external monitor. Try and frame it up while the smoke is still around. And then do the slow kind of follow like this. Oh geez. My leg. All right, and that's shot number one. Let's take number one. But I feel like I can be a little bit better with this. Now, a quick tip is that if you have a hard time nailing focus in the last moment, or it's hard to get that final frame, what you can actually do is to film it in reverse. So I'm gonna try one where I start eye level with the product, and then I'm gonna move it upwards like that, because that might be a little bit easier than the other way around. I'm gonna try both, and I'll just find out in the edit which one actually looks better. Oh no, there's too much smoke. Now it's pretty hard to see the actual product. You know what, let's go back to the original plan. It's actually kind of tough. This is a little bit ambitious for a money shot. I did say to save the ones that will take multiple takes last, but this is a pretty important shot, so if it's gonna take me 20 times, I'm gonna do 20 times. So I'm just gonna watch back the shot and see if it's good enough. I mean, I can't watch every shot, but I can at least see if this is workable and if I can fix it in post. Just never tell yourself it's okay to fix it in post. I know I say to never say that, but this is one of those shots where I plan to enhance it in post. So right now I finished my first shot, which is the master shot. Hopefully it turns out well when I import it. If not, then full of regret. -y. So I'm just gonna tear this off from the gimbal. While I'm doing that, I can kind of talk you through whatever you guys wanna hear. What, what, what would that be? So the next shot would be the uh, sliding shot. It'll kind of be like near the beginning where we build some mystery on what this product might be. And it's not gonna require this gimbal anymore. That's why I am tearing the camera off 
and I'm gonna slide this uh, into a cage and then I'm gonna put it on a slider and I'm just gonna push in for this hopefully beautiful shot of the product in a silhouette. So like I said, builds that mysterious air around it before finally revealing what it looks like. All right, I think that's good enough. Uh, although you can still see the logo and the details of it, I can always uh, crush the darker parts of the image so you don't really see it, so it still feels mysterious. And then I can always do some VFX work to hide the logo and also the bottom of this vinyl so that you don't see all the ugly stuff underneath. I'm not saying that I'm fixing it in post. I'm saying that this was a strategic decision that was made prior to the edit. Yeah, that's not convincing you guys, is it? All right, so this next one, not gonna lie, is a little bit sketchy. I basically taped some fishing wire over to the top of the speaker over here. I'm hoping that this tape will be strong enough so that I can lift up the speaker like this. I'm going to basically drop this onto the concrete floor to show that it's durable, it's a durable speaker. And I'm just gonna hope that the fishing wire doesn't come off the tape and that it doesn't spin around or that the speaker doesn't break. Let's not focus too much on the wrists and hope for the best. I'm also hoping that I can actually erase the fishing wire and the tape in post. For someone who says not to fix it in post, I really am relying a lot on VFX. No pressure, no room for failure. If I fail the shot, I just don't have a product video to show at the end. So I'm gonna do this kind of like what I did before where I'm going to do one version where it is in real time. I'm gonna just basically drop this down so that the corner hits the uh, surface. And then I'm gonna try one in reverse where it is already on the surface and then I'll just pull upward. And then hopefully when I reverse the shot, it'll look okay. I cannot do it in real time. I gotta do this in reverse. I know I say to save the ambitious shots for last, but right now I'm feeling like every shot is ambitious. Get it into the position. I have one hand on the slider. As soon as I feel like it is ready, I can just... So the next one that I'm doing is uh, some rumbling dirt. I literally just stepped at the front door, looked at some dirt that was on the ground near some plants, and I took it, kept it over here in this nice little saran wrap. This looks an awful lot like contrabands. So I'm just going to hope that there are no bugs or insects or anything like that that I picked up along with the dirt. Ugh. And basically this shot is to kind of simulate the strength of the sound, seeing the effect of sound. I mean, you could always add some like sound waves and VFX and that's a really nice stylistic choice, but I really wanted to show how it affects its surroundings as well. And although I'll probably be using some VFX to show visual sound waves, I wanna have a nice variety so it doesn't feel too stale. And we're not actually gonna be using sound, we're just gonna just hit the table. Hopefully it'll sell the effect that it looks like sound vibrations, I don't know. I've never actually tried this before, but in my head, I can see it working out, so let's find out. Let's try on this side, maybe I'll have better luck. Maybe I should hit a little bit harder. All right, so I get to actually be in front of camera now, but like you don't actually see that it's me. It's just a clean plate of this speaker that's spinning and it's gonna be spinning on my fingertip. Now, usually I would wanna save the clean plate, like shooting in front of a green screen and all that stuff. In this case, a blue screen. I would save that after the shot so that I can use the same lighting and stuff like that. But I'm pretty sure this is the same lighting that I will be using for the shot where I will actually spin it on my finger or at least fake spin it on my finger. I'm shooting this first because this is already taped up and I don't want to take away the tape and then slap it back on. It's just a bit of a hassle. So I figured while this is set up like this, I'm going to just shoot this plate of it uh, spinning around. I have the monitor over here facing towards myself so I can see what's going on. Hopefully I'm not like blocking the lighting. I think this is gonna be the tricky part. Now this one's a little more dangerous, a little more risky because I'm gonna be dropping the speaker onto the pillow and basically fake the action that it's spinning on my fingertip. And I'm gonna use that clean plate of the spinning uh, speaker earlier that I just did and then place it on top of my finger. So that's the plan, let's try it. So I gotta make sure that I'm a great hand model here. And then it hit the pillow, it just didn't stay on it. And this is why we do the money shot first. You good. We're just gonna place the pillow back a little bit. Now we're gonna try it again. Thank God, this is a spec ad. Huh, I guess it really is durable. Next up is a bird's eye shot, which is why it's set up like this on a C stand. And then the HDMI cable is running all the way over here to the external recorder where I get to watch what happens. Just realized that the behind the scenes was not rolling. So just to give you a quick rundown, I was not recording this by accident. And then it turns out I was also not recording the behind the scenes. Life of a solo shooter. Gonna actually roll it this time and let's make it happen. 
All right, we are almost there. There are two more shots for this one. It's another bird's eye shot, and it's going to be the initial reveal, the very first shot where you see kind of the rim in the outer circle of the speaker. At least I'm hoping that's the effect that I'm gonna achieve. I'm just gonna be using this one light and just kind of move it around, and hopefully it'll be nice. So guys, we're at the last shot, which is the most ambitious shot. I saved that best for last because it's the one that's probably gonna take quite a few takes, and even if it doesn't work out, it's okay. I hope it does work out though, because in my head when I play it through, it seems pretty nice and I haven't done something like this before, so I thought, why not? So the idea is that I'm going to basically place my finger down to like activate the Bluetooth, I guess, on my phone, and then revolve the entire table so that it shows the speaker uh, in the foreground. And this will all make sense when I play this through, but it's gonna involve rotating this chair. I have this whole surface on a chair that can swivel. Just hope it'll be steady and that it'll actually turn out looking good. Let's find out. So we're gonna hit roll. I'm going to actually gauge where my finger's gonna be. So that's gonna be right over here. So what's gonna happen is I'm going to move it out of frame first. Like this. So I'm going to move down. This is kinda hard. This choreography of my finger in the camera. Three, two, one. That was not the spot. Three, two, one. That was also not the spot. Man, it's harder than it looks. Let's make a bet on how many takes it's gonna take. I'm gonna say 26. Take your guess in the comments below and we're gonna see. All right, so that was, I think my fourth try and I missed, that's my fifth. That was my sixth, that was my seventh. Missed again, missed again, missed again. All right, I think that might be it. I'm going to lock the camera and then we are going to swivel the chair. Don't hit the camera, don't hit the light. That's kind of sketchy. And okay, we're gonna keep going, we're gonna keep going. Oh no clear through the lens and then it will stop right in front of the speaker like this i don't really know how that's going to turn out i just watched the shot back and i think that is good enough for me to work out in post and vfx and let future herman worry about it guys that is a wrap that is the behind the scenes for the production and now that the production phase is done we move on to post-production. Now I can do whatever the hell I want with a speaker. I can break it. I can see how actually like durable it is. So I'm gonna do a stress test, let me know. Maybe the speaker was better quality than I thought. All right guys, we are now at my personal favorite stage of the process, post-production. It's time to dump all the footage that you shot onto your computer and open it up in your editing software of choice. In this case, I'll be using Adobe Premiere Pro to do the cut and After Effects to do any VFX work. Now, I won't be going into the nitty gritty on how to navigate through the software. Instead, I'll be going through my workflow and my procedure in post-production while assuming that you know how to use your editing software. If you'd like a more comprehensive breakdown on how I made certain editing decisions or visual effects, then drop a comment down below so I know that it's something that you guys would actually want to see. With all that said, here we go. Step number one is to set up the project. So first I'll be importing my clips and keep everything as organized as I possibly can and then have everything in different folders and rename them accordingly. Quick tip, I like numbering things so that they all you know, appear in the order that I want them to. So number one, I like having my current cuts and then I'll have archive cuts, all my raw dailies over here and then sound effects and music, all nice folders. And you'll thank yourself later because you'll always wanna make changes later on. And then when you're looking for a specific asset or a specific piece of footage or graphic or something like that, you can always go into your bins uh, that were nicely created by your previous self or your assistant. I don't know, I, I can't afford one, so I don't have an assistant, I gotta do it myself. So I'm always happy when I'm not like rummaging through like my stuff just to find one specific file. So do yourself a favor and keep it organized. Next is step two, which is finding my best pieces. Now what that means is I'll be going through all the footage and keeping the best parts of the best takes. These are the clips that I'll be using in my rough cut. Now a little tip is that I usually go straight to the last take because that's usually the best one for me. Now if you have someone assisting you or you have the extra time, you could take notes on set and keep track of which take that you thought was the best. I don't personally do that because about 70% of the time the last take is when I determine that the shot was good enough and that I can actually move on. Although it's only step two, it's one of the hardest steps because when you're choosing shots to use, it means that you're letting go the rest of the shots that you worked hard on. Most of the time though, I'll keep a variation or two of the same take and then let myself face that ultimatum later. Future Herman can worry about it. So as you can see, these were the shots that I thought were viable out of the takes that I had. Like, so initially what I did was I took all the footage that I have over here and then I just like slapped them in like this and then I went through each clip and then I tried to determine whether or not it's going to make it in the rough cut. So all this over here was condensed into this so i only have one clip of each basically uh, except for this one i kept myself uh, a variation just in case i wanted to spin the other way like the shadow to spin the other way so uh, here i have 
more options. Oh my gosh, these, these are decisions that I'll be making later. But as long as I make the crucial decisions now, I'll have less to stress out about and I'll know what I have to actually work with. And yeah, I, I love these ones where I just give myself one shot. So um, these are the ones that I'm gonna be using into the rough cut and just gonna go straight in that timeline. Here at step three, I either begin a rough cut focusing on the visuals or cut the music track first. Usually I'll cut the music first if there is a specific track that was agreed with the producer or the client to be used, or if there's a specific time duration that I need to hit. Now, if that's the case, the music acts as kind of like the boundaries of how long my shots can be in the cut. This can be an advantage if you don't know how long you should hold your shots for, and you'll have beats that you can hit in the music as well. So this is my rough cut. Uh, this is my cut number one. I placed all the shots that I wanted into this and a time to the music trimmed to the way and the duration that I wanted to uh, kind of fit in. This feels so intimate, you know, like showing you my project file, especially in early stages. It's so like embarrassing, but I'm going to play it through once just so you know how my rough cut ends up looking like and how big of a jump it is to the final product, I guess. So this is without any colors, any VFX, any sound effects or anything like that. So it's strictly for page page. Pacing. It's strictly for pacing and also how long I want to keep each shot for. So let's play it. Oh, and all this text over here, we're gonna explain that next. Next is step number four, which is using placeholders. So while I'm doing my rough cut, I'll usually put in some placeholders for shots that require VFX or will have some sort of VFX added later. I usually put a simple title card or a note on the bottom to remind myself what it is that I want to do with that shot. That way, when I bring it into After Effects, I'll have something to refer to. Step number five for me is VFX. Now I start doing any VFX required by dynamic linking it over to After Effects. Now, if you're using another editing software, then you'll want to import it in whichever way that you wish and use whatever software that you want to use. Now, maybe you don't even have any VFX work that needs to be done, or you have a VFX artist taking on that portion. You lucky son of a gun. If that's the case, don't worry about this step. You can always do basic VFX work and add titles and stuff like that in the editing software anyways. So this is my After Effects file, another peek into my soul, but um, I have you know all my compositions numbered. So I try to keep things organized, just like I said in step one. And yeah, I do all the VFX in After Effects and then afterwards when I'm happy with it, I export it into files that I will import back into Premiere Pro. And then I'll place them in my timeline and swap them out for that disgusting garbage that I showed you earlier in my rough cut. Now, once you've imported your VFX shots and have your visuals pretty much locked down, it's time to move into sound design. Here we'll be adding sound effects and adjust audio levels to have a coherent piece of audio to complement the visuals. So you can search up free sound effects, buy royalty free ones, or you can just record them yourself. Please be sure to spend the time that it deserves when you're doing sound design. It really enhances the quality of your end video in a way that many people who are starting out might look over. So because sound effect plays such a crucial role, I kind of want to just show you a cut where it's just the sound effects and how it's still kind of like viable. If you know what I mean, like it still adds impact to those moments that really need it. So uh, just muting the music, this is what it looks like. So as you can hear, there are some impact shots in the beginning. There's some earthquake rumbling to really add to that, you know, rumbling vibration that's you can see visually. And we have the sound effect of like spinning. So it works with a spinning uh, speaker on my fingertip as well. So it's just things that enhance the idea and the visual that you see and kind of aids it. And having this roar sound effect and also the glass shatter really adds to the impact of the actual glass shatter that you see as well. And then we have this rise that goes like, whoosh, and then it's a, it's a hit, you know, it's a, it's a smack in the face where it's a nice way to wrap things up. So yeah, I mean, you can be the judge on whether or not it really uh, amplifies the final product. But I, for me personally, I think it really does. It's that polish that I think every video needs and it should never be looked over. Usually once I'm happy with my sound design, I move on to color grading. You probably don't want to deliver a product commercial with the colors from your raw footage, unless you know, you're going for the raw and in the moment stylistic choice. But most of the time you'll want to produce visuals that are more polished and color grading 
is how you do it. Now, I personally like to just color grade in Premiere Pro and stay in that ecosystem instead of using something like DaVinci Resolve. I'll color in a way that matches the theme of the project. In this case, I'm going for kind of like a sleek, high contrast type of look. So I wanna make sure that I stay faithful to that vision. So this is the uh, cut where I start coloring the footage and instead of hiding and unhiding layers, I'm just gonna show you a direct comparison on the screen of some shots of ungraded footage and the graded version next to it. So you can have that direct comparison. So at this point, everything should be put together now for your video. So it's time to export it, take a quick little coffee break, go for a walk, and then come back with a fresher pair of eyes. Hopefully you didn't steal someone else's. It is now time to review the video and see if you missed anything since it's pretty easy to be tunnel vision when all you've been staring at is your editing software all day. So it is important to step away from the computer so that when you come back to it, it's easier to catch any changes that you'll want to make. Now, other than the obvious fixes, like maybe seeing a light stand in the background or finding a blemish on your product, what else can you look for when you're reviewing your video? So depending on the platform that your product commercial will be airing on, a general rule of thumb that I follow is to keep the video as short as possible. So think of it this way. If you're swiping on Instagram and an ad plays, maybe you're interested in like the first five seconds, but all you have to do is flick that thumb and then you swipe into the next video. It's just so easy to lose someone's attention, especially if your video is being published on social media. So when you are reviewing your product video, take away shots that do not serve a purpose. If there's a shot that's really similar to another one and doesn't deliver any new information about the product, get rid of it. Perfection is when there's nothing left to take away. None of my work is perfect, but the final videos are always a big improvement from the first draft because of this. So if you've made it this far, then congratulations guys, because you've made an entire product commercial from scratch, from being handed the product for the first time to having a fully fleshed out video. That's a pretty amazing feat, especially if you're just starting out. I hope that watching this guide has given you a solid outline to follow if you ever feel stuck or you felt intimidated to actually take that first step. You know, taking that first step is always the hardest. So I encourage you to just dive into it and don't worry if it doesn't come out amazing because the more that you conceptualize ideas, shoot and edit, the better you'll become. As I said before, you can always come back to this video and go to a specific timestamp if you ever forget what to do or you have creative block. We've all been there. I feel like I'm even gonna go back to this video a few times, so don't worry. Now, the things that I went over are not limited to just product videos, so I hope that what you take away today will be applied to other aspects of filmmaking as well. Now, if you've made a product video by following this guide, leave a link in the comments below so that we can all check it out. And if you haven't started yet, then drop a comment on what kind of product or brand that you would love to shoot for. Set up that goal and hold yourself accountable by actually typing it out and having that goal physically there in front of you. And if you found this guide helpful, please help me feed the algorithm gods by hitting the thumbs up button on this video. Share it with someone who would find this guide helpful as well. And please subscribe if you would like to see more content on my channel because I'm just starting out and I'd love to know if I should continue making content on my YouTube channel. Now, if you'd like to take the next step in making sick product videos, my friend Quinn has an online course called Product Video School, where she shares her experience and techniques with you, all through a project-based program tailored for all skill levels. I always think it's great to get different perspectives on how people do things, so you don't want to miss this. You can either click the pop-up, which I think is over here somewhere, or you can check out the link in the description below. Again, guys, everything that you learned today is completely free. So if you'd like to support me and you could use some motion graphic assets to give your video an upgrade, check out my pack called Enter the Future. I've been using these assets throughout this whole guide, so if you want a modern edge in your commercials that you work on, consider checking it out. You can either click the pop-up like before, or you can check out the link in the description below. Now, if you wanna stay in touch and see what I'm up to next, I'm pretty active on Instagram, so you can check that out. The handle is at Coffee Liquor. That is it, guys. That is all I have for now. Again, my name is Herman, and I'll see you guys in the next video.